Okay, this is Physics 1C for October 4th. Uh, today we're going to be talking about capacitors. Uh, before we get into that and talk about what they are, I want to do one more problem that we didn't get a chance to do. This problem is uh, is less of a uh, example and more of a proof, in a way, of something that we talked about a while ago. So we are doing this perf problem because we want to prove something about conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. The thing that we want to prove is that um, the charge density is the highest near sharp points. That's what we want to prove. That the charge density for a charged conductor is the highest near sharp points. So, in order to do that, we have this problem right here. Make it get a little bigger so you can see what it says, and then we'll... It says two spherical conductors of radii R1 and R2, shown here, they're both spheres, are separated by a distance much greater than the radius of either sphere. So even though they look like they're close together right here, the distance right here between these two is going to be really far. This is a very long distance. So they're really far apart. They're connected by a conducting wire as shown. So we have a really long conducting wire. The charges on the spheres in equilibrium are Q1 and Q2, respectively, and they are uniformly charged. So you have charge Q1 on this one, Q2 on this one, and they're uniformly charged, which of course means that the charges are kind of spread out evenly. And because they're conductors, all of that charge is going to be, is, is the charge on the conductor spread throughout its volume, or is it mostly contained on the surface? The surface, right? Because it's a conductor, we know all the charge has to go towards the surface. Because the charges like to spread apart from each other, and the farthest they can spread from each other is to go to the surface. What we want to do here is we want to find the ratio of the magnitudes of the electric fields at the surfaces of the spheres. That's what we want to do. Okay. I think this problem came up in a job interview I had one time. And it was nice to already know how to do it. Okay, so... Let's draw our own picture of this. So we need two spheres, right? We got one here, and then we're going to need another one over here. That doesn't look like a sphere. I don't even know what that was. There we go. Two spheres. Uh, the key thing to understand here is that R2 is smaller than R1, and they are connected by a wire. So there's a wire here. They both, con they both contain charges, so we're going to have positive charges on this one. We're going to have positive charges on this one over here. My goal will be to prove to you that the charges on the smaller sphere are more densely packed, and that as a result, the electric field near the smaller sphere will be larger. That's my goal. So I'll draw that as it is. This distance is far. Sometimes they do that by like drawing a couple lines like this. These two things are far apart. Much farther than the radius of the spheres themselves. We know this is R1, and this one has a radius that we call R2. And the one on the left carries charge Q1. The one on the right carries charge Q2. So what we are going to do, our goal is to find the ratio of the magnitudes of the electric fields of the sphere. So if on this sphere here I told you that the electric field points this way, as it does, and I call the electric field E1, and I tell you that the electric field on the surface of this one points perpendicular away from the surface, and I call it E2, our goal is to find the ratio of those magnitudes. Um, we're going to be finding the ratio of E2 over E1. We'll do it symbolically, and we'll th throw some numbers in there uh, to figure out what's going on. OK. So first thing we can say is that when I have a sphere with radius R1 and charge Q1, we know what the value of the electric field near that surface is, right? Once you're outside the surface, the electric field is the same as the electric field of a point charge. 
So KQ1 over R1 squared. This is the electric field at the actual surface. Okay, so that's why I'm using R1, which is the radius of the object. The electric field for E2 is similarly described by K times its charge Q2. And since we're finding the electric field at this surface, we're gonna have R2 squared in the denominator down here. We'd like to find a ratio of these two things, but you can see that if I take the ratio of E1 over E2, I'm still gonna have a bunch of other quantities in there. Q1, R1, Q2, R2. So what I'd like to do is to eliminate the ratio of Q1 over Q2. And the way that we're gonna do that is by using the concept of electric potential. When I connect these two objects with this long cable right here, we basically form one very large conductor, right? the long wire and the two orbs, two spheres, they all form one very large conductor. And what do we know about the electric potential if you have a conductor like that? What's the electric potential? How is the electric potential over here related to the electric potential over here, for example? Uh, Tom, you're making some noise. If you could uh, mute your mic, Tom Gui. What do we know about the electric potential? Oh no, Tom, we can. I'm gonna mute your mic. Yep, there we go. Right, the electric potential is going to be equal. So if I know the electric potential here, it's going to be equal to the electric potential over here, basically. And why is that? It's because if it wasn't, then like, let's say for example, let's just pick some numbers. Let's say that I tell you that the electric potential at the surface of this object right here is 10 volts, right? And I tell you the electric potential over here, we measure it and we find that it's eight volts. So basically the larger sphere has a higher potential than the lower sphere. If this was true, it's not gonna be true, but if this was true and this was 10 volts and this was eight volts, what would happen? What would happen? What would happen, for example, to a piece of charge, a charged particle in this wire? The wire is, after all, full of charged particles. If the left side was 10 volts and the right side was 8 volts, what would that charged particle do? the charge would want to go to the lower side, exactly. It would go to the lower side, exactly, because positively charged particles always flow from high to low. If I tell you this is 10 volts and this is eight volts, that's like saying that this wire is a, is a ramp and this is 10 meters and this is eight meters and the wire is downhill, basically. So, so even if one of them had a higher voltage than the other one, what would happen is that charges would flow from the higher voltage object to the lower voltage object until equilibrium was reached when they both have the same voltage. Does that make sense? Until both of them have a voltage of nine volts and now no, nothing can flow anymore. That's the true equilibrium state is when the potentials are the same. And that's indicated in the subscript right here. It says two charged spheres are connected by a conducting wire. The spheres are at the same electric potential. Many different things in the problem hint at that, but they have the exact same electric potential. So if I want to draw the if I want to write down an equation for the electric potential on the surface of this sphere right here, we could write K Q1 over R1. And for the electric potential over here, V2, we can write K times Q2 over R2. And here again, I'm talking about the electric potential at the surface. So this would be V2 and this would be V1. But as we said, these two have to be equal to each other which means that we have a relationship between uh, all of these different variables. And what we can do is we can cancel out these Ks and we can rewrite this. What are we gonna do? We're gonna do E2 over E1. How do I wanna write it then? Let's see, I wanna get, probably doesn't really matter. Let's get the ratio of Q1 over Q2. I think that's, no, we want Q2 over Q1. Let's write this as We're gonna cross multiply, R2 is gonna come up here. We're gonna leave R1 down there. 
I'm going to divide Q1 to the right-hand side, Q2 over Q1. So that gives us a relationship between the charges on our object. What does this tell us? From the beginning, remember that one of the key things that we're going to need to use at some point in this is the fact that R2 is less than R1. We're going to need to use that, that fact at some point, right? So what does this tell us? This tells us that the amount of charge Q2 compared to the amount of charge Q1 is exactly the same ratio as the ratio of the radii. So that tells us that Q2 is less than Q1, right? Probably not too surprising. I mean, Q1's bigger. It's a bigger sphere so that it can hold more charges, right? What it also allows us to do is to finish solving this. So I want to find E2 over E1. And we can do that by taking the value of E2, which is right here, KQ2 over R2 squared. That's the electric field of object 2 at the surface. Divide by E1, which is KQ1 over R1 whole squared. This is going to be equal to, the Ks will cancel. We're going to have Q2 over Q1, which we have down here what that's equal to multiplied by, now we have R1 squared is going to go to the top, so we have R1 squared over R2 squared. Now we can plug in Q2 over Q1, as we can see right here, is equal to R2 over R1. And now we get a pretty simple result for the ratio. We end up getting that, scroll down just a little bit here, we end up getting that E2 over E1 is equal to the ratio of the inverse of their radii. So that's what we get. That's our final result. We're going to take that and we'll bring it up here so we can see everything all together. Let's just put that. Um, I guess it doesn't matter. I guess if I scroll up like this, then we can probably see everything. Yeah, okay, we can. Okay, so we know that E2 over E1 is the same as the ratio of R1 over R2. So let's pick some numbers so we can understand what this actually means. First of all, we knew that R1 was less than R2, R1 is bigger than R2. So this tells us that E2 is bigger than E1. But let's say that we pick R2 to be equal to three meters and R1 to be equal to nine meters. These numbers are huge, but it doesn't matter. Then we know that the ratio of E2 over E1 would be equal to nine over three, which is about three. This tells us that E2 is three times as big as E1. For example, if E2 was, is that off my screen? Yeah, we're good. For example, if E2 was equal to, oh, sorry, if E1 was equal to like 10 volts per meter, then E2 would be 30 volts per meter. Okay, so why should you care about that? Now what we know is that it's the smaller sphere that has the larger electric field. And it has a larger electric field because the charges are more densely packed in this region. We know that Q1 has more charge, but it's the dense packing of these charges that makes this electric field so big. And in order to, to kind of prove that to you, you have to remember when we talked about conductors and electrostatic equilibrium, we figured out that the value of the electric field near the surface of these objects is directly proportional to the charge density at the surface. So the value of E1 is its surface charge density sigma divided by epsilon naught, and the value E2 is its surface charge density divided by epsilon naught. So because the electric fields are proportional to the charge densities, that means you get the exact same relationship here, which is that the charge density uh, sigma two should be equal to three times the charge density sigma one. That means the charges are packed three times more close together in here. So if, for example, there's there's eight charges on this one, there would be 24 charges on this one, all packed into that smaller region, okay? And that means that what I said above is true. Charge density for a charge conductor is the highest near sharp points. And in this case, a sharp point is indicated by the fact that this sphere has a smaller radius. One of the ways that we measure curvature Maybe you've learned this in your math class. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. One of the ways that we measure curvature is by uh, something called radius of curvature. And the way that that's done, just as an aside right here, suppose that I have a conductor. 
and it's shaped like this. It has a very sharp point there, and then it kind of gets wider on this side over here. So we have our conductor. How do I describe curvature? We're gonna use something called radius of curvature. Okay, and this is how it works. This program is actually pretty good for doing this. So what you do is you take a circle. The way I learned this, we call this a kissing circle. What you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna basically take your circle and you basically make it as big as you can such that it only touches the object at one point, okay? And you can see that when you have a larger, larger area, like a, a place where it's not very smooth, right? You can make a pretty big circle and make it so that it only touches at one point here. Eventually, if you get too big, you know, you can't actually fit it in there. And I'll give you an example of that. If I take this same circle and I try to put it right here, you can see that it's automatically touching more than one point here, right? So in order to get a circle that fits, I'm gonna have to have a very tiny circle here. That's not even small enough, right? I don't even know if I can make it small enough. So basically you wanna put a circle that will touch at just one point. This one has to be super tiny, which kind of proves the point. It's getting to a point that I can't even move the circle, which is kind of funny. So what we do is we say the radius of the circle that touches at one point is the radius of curvature. And the smaller the radius of curvature, the sharper something is. Is that something you all learned before? So if I have a small circle, it's sharper. It has higher curvature, which is to say that the charge density for the charge conductor is highest near sharp points because the small conductor is sharper. This is why if you want to shock someone, you can shock people by using the tip of your finger. It's a lot harder to shock people with your palm. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Professor, that radius of curvature doesn't have anything to do with the electric field varying inversely to the square of the radius or anything like that? Well, you know, that may have something to do with it, right? I mean, if you think about it, like, may maybe there is a connection there. I don't know. It's a good question. But yeah, they're, they're separate concepts, for sure. Definitely separate ideas. Definitely. Good question. Do you all learn about radius of curvature? Have you all seen this before? All you need to know is that the way we measure curvature is by using these little kissing circles. The tinier the radius, the bigger the curvature is. If you think about the surface of the Earth, right? Think about the surface of the Earth. The Earth looks really flat, right? Because the radius of curvature for the Earth is the radius of the Earth. It's a sphere, right? when you have a really big radius of curvature, things can look flat, you know? And the Earth looks flat. That's because its radius of curvature is gigantic. So it's it's effectively a flat surface for all intents and purposes. It's not really a flat surface, but it's technically, it looks flat locally. All right, so um, that's that. That's the end of our discussion of electric potential in and of itself. It doesn't mean we're not gonna keep using voltage we're still gonna be talking about voltage. We're still gonna be talking about electric fields, but we're gonna now shift into um, talking about circuits for the next month or so, okay? And the first topic for, um, the first topic for uh, circuits is capacitors. This chapter will continue to be electrostatics. This is the last chapter on electrostatics, okay? After this, um, charges are gonna move around, okay? But we're still talking about electrostatics. So what is a capacitor? A capacitor is basically a electrical component that can store energy to be released at a later time.
It's an electrical component that can store energy to be released at a later time. So I can give you a bunch of examples of these, but I'm just curious. Can anyone here tell me an example of something that has a capacitor inside of it before I even describe what it is? What have you heard about these things, capacitors? A car? A car is definitely going to have some, some uh, touch screens. Yeah, I think this is something that uh, Mr. Username, Mr. User Account, had said before that uh, the the touch screen in your phone acts like a capacitor when you touch it. That's right. So let's let's write these things down. So um, we'll just say these are usage of capacitors. Okay. So camera in a camera, the flash in a camera. That's one. Solar panels might have them in it, but I don't, I don't know that that's particularly directly related. Um, touch screens operate off of the concept of capacitors. A radio. Radios definitely have capacitors inside of them. They usually have, they possibly have a variable capacitor that can allow you to tune the radio, that's one thing. What about um, if somebody has like a uh, transformers? Don't they could have they could have capacitors in them? I don't know. At least the way we teach them in physics, there's there's no capacitors inside of them. But that doesn't mean that they don't they have smooth. Yeah, okay, I believe that. I can believe that. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Microphones definitely might have capacitors in them. Some other things that uh, have capacitors inside of them uh, would be like. I think that the classic example is a defibrillator. I don't know how to spell this. Defrib? Later? I don't know. The thing where basically you have those two pads and they they rub them together and then they push a button and there's this huge charging sound, which is like a whoop. It's like a like loud. And then you take them and you put them on someone's chest and it can deliver a huge shock of energy to them with the goal of being to like restart their heart effectively. That's what a defibrillator is, those two pads that you see. That's a perfect example of the energy storage nature of a capacitor. Um, in fact, the flash in a camera can sound very similar. If you take an old camera, I'll show you this when we go to school. Or on, on Wednesday, I'll try to remind me to show you a, a camera with a capacitor inside of it. But uh, the flash, what it will do when you... You know, like, it's not so much the... Ca like, how, how old... How old am I, and how young are you all? Have you all ever used uh, disposable cameras before? You have? Some of you have? Like those yellow, like you go buy it from a store and then you take pictures and then you... Okay, probably a long time ago though, right? Like nowadays everybody just has phones, so there's no point in having disposable cameras. They still exist. Do you remember on those disposable cameras that there'd be a flash button? And when you push the flash button, when you push the flash button, there would be this this winding up sound. Does that sound familiar to you all? Maybe not. It's probably been too long. I don't know. Some of you might remember that. Okay. And then you take the camera, you take the picture, and then there'd be a huge flash, right? Again, if you don't remember this or have an experience, I will show you. I'll show you uh, a disposable camera, and I'll let you hear that sound, and you will remember it. If you've ever heard it, you'll remember it because it's pretty distinct. It's this like whirring sound, and it's like a high pitched raising sound. And the reason why is because there's a crystal inside that's oscillating and basically charging up a capacitor inside the device. And then once the capacitor has gained enough charge, right, you can take the picture and the flash will release the energy um, that was stored up in the capacitor. And it's, it's how you get a bright burst of light so that you can use it to take pictures at nighttime and stuff like that. Um, your cell phones, you know, someone said radio, right? Um, this radio that, that was described here, this could be a Wi-Fi radio, for example. Um, in your cell phones, there's definitely capacitors that are used to tune into your um, your Wi-Fi networks and stuff like that. Um, other places that you're going to see capacitors are in lasers, so like pulsed lasers. They're also used anytime a timing element needs to be used. So like, um, I always think of windshield wipers. Bug zapper? I don't know about that. 
I don't know much about bug zappers. I've seen them before. I don't know anything about how they work. I will say pretty much any type of electrical device you have is going to have some kind of capacitor in it. Um, so it's very possible, very likely, that the bug zapper has some kind of capacitor in it. Because its job is to basically zap the bugs when they get there, right? So to go look at how that works. Yeah, keyboards. That's one. Keyboards on computers, any kind, they're going to use capacitors. Um, and then the one I was going to mention is like windshield wipers, for example. So like on your windshield wipers, you have like different settings, you know? There's like the quick setting that goes up and down like this. There's a slower setting that still goes regularly, but it's like slower. And then there's like the intermittent setting where it, it goes and it wipes the window and then it waits for a long period of time. And then it wipes the window again, and then it waits. And it wipes the window again. Okay. Um, and uh, the idea of that is that like capacitors can introduce timing elements into circuits. So when you're when you're rotating the knob on your or a switch or whatever it is in your car that allows the windshield wipers to change speeds, usually what you're doing is you're manipulating some component of the device, and sometimes it could be a capacitor. It can be done in other ways too, but could just be that you're changing the way the capacitor is shaped, as it turns out. So it's an electrical component that can be stored, ener stored energy to be released at a later time. So what does this look like? So now that we've kind of talked about like what they are, not what they are, but like how they're used, so we can see they show up in all kinds of devices. Um, I suspect that some component of a, yeah, blenders. Blenders is very similar. I see what you're saying, Ange. A blender is just like a windshield wiper, right? In the sense that it has the different speeds. Is that what you mean? Yeah. For sure. So it would be the same concept. That's a good point. Um, OK, so how do we think of capacitors? Well, usually what we think of is you have two pieces of like metal. It doesn't have to be metal. Separated by a gap. So you have like a piece of metal right here, another piece of metal right here. So this is like a metal. And in order for the capacitor to store charge, what we do is we connect wires and then put a battery in the system. So we'll just put a normal D cell battery here. Let's say this has a voltage delta V between its ends of 1.5 volts. And what happens is that if we connect this up like this and like this, and we make sure that the two plates can't actually touch each other, okay? And we do so by leaving an air gap in between here or something. Any kind of insulator can be placed between the plates, basically, is what can happen. What happens now is that electrical charges come from the positive side of the battery, and they flow into this plate right here. And they can't really go anywhere else, so the plate ends up being positively charged. So the plate that's touching the positive terminal of the battery ends up with a positive charge. The plate that's touching the negative terminal of the battery, it gets a negative charge. So you end up with a situation where you have a plus Q on this side and a minus Q on this side. And what'll happen is that the size of the charges will, all, will end up being equal to each other. And there's kind of a maximum capacity of how much charge this kind of system can hold but this whole thing right here is the capacitor, okay? This separation of charges, positive on one side, negative on the other side, this thing is the capacitor, okay? And we describe its capacitance, C, as being equal to the amount of charge that can be placed on it per unit voltage. We call this capacitance. And it really is a type of capacity because depending on the size and shape of the plates, that's gonna control how much charge you can place on there. And the larger the voltage, um, is, the voltage is also going to affect what that capacitance quantity is, basically. That's the relationship. And the unit, you can kind of see from 
what is written there is going to be one coulomb divided by volts is equal to one farad. It's named after Michael Faraday, but they just call it, instead of calling it one Faraday, it's just called one Farad. Why did they do that? Why did they cut off his name? Why isn't it just Faraday's? I don't know. doesn't matter. Point is that it's named after Michael Faraday, and um, the unit is Coulombs for volts, okay? Yeah, maybe it's just too long. I don't know. Thinking of the other units we have. They're all pretty short, right? Watts, Newton, Joules. They're pretty short. Okay. Um, yeah. This is a definition, by the way. This is just how we define capacitance. We could have defined it in another way. We could have defined it as the inverse of this. It could have been volts per, per charge. But we decided to define it like this, and that's just how it works. Um, I'll just stop right there. Any questions so far? Does it depend on the material used? Yes, it does. It depends on, actually, the main thing that it depends on is what's inside, as it turns out. It turns out that by placing something like plastic or paper in here, you can actually alter the size of the capacitance. When I say the whole thing is the capacitor, that's the plates, the wires, the battery, and the charge on the plates. Well, not the battery, but just the plates with its charges on it. That's the capacitor, but not the battery itself. Although, if you want to charge it up, you need to have the battery, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be charged to be a capacitor. In fact, I guess one thing I should show you is what these things, uh, let's, I'm going to show you what they look like in a second. I'm going to do, we'll do one kind of like quick calculation. Yeah, the size of the capacitance is going to turn out to depend on the area of the plates, how big they are, and how close together they are. Those are the two biggest things. And the other other factor, which we'll learn about much later, is what's inside of them. So anyway, it's just the plates mostly. That's the capacitor right there. So we define capacitance. I will say that one farad is a huge amount of capacitance. Uh, common values of capacitance are going to be like in microfarads, nanofarads, and stuff like that. So if you were to go buy a capacitor from your local Radio Shack, if you can find one, or you buy it off the internet, you'd be purchasing a capacitor that could have values of like, let's say, 3.5 microfarads. I know in the lab, I'll show you a very large capacitor that has a capacitance of about 3,000 microfarads. Is this related to the Casimir effect? Wow, that's a very... How do you know about that? The Casimir effect is what, Aunt Evan? For those, for the many people who probably didn't know what that is. What is it? It's when two plates are really close and there is propulsion. Yeah, it's kind of right. So... The Casimir effect is a it's a quantum effect, and it, it happens in even in outer space. If you if you take two metal plates and you place them very very close together, the two plates will be attracted to each other. And um, from classical physics, there's there's nothing that really tells us why that occurs, but it's it's something that we can produce, and I, it's been measured, right, Evan? I don't know how much you know about it. I'm very I'm reasonably certain that this effect has been scientifically measured and that we have a do we have a good explanation of it i think we have some kind of quantum explanation of a quantum mechanics explanation but i don't i don't remember if it's a good explanation or not it's it's kind of in that area of physics that's like on the edge of we don't really understand it very well i think but i, I i'm not sure anyway i don't know if it's related to this but i do know when i read about the casimir effect the first thing i think in my mind is a capacitor so, you know what I mean? Like, I can see, I can see why, you, why you asked that question. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We can talk more about that later. It's a good question. Has an effect's very interesting. It's very interesting. Okay, so common values of these things are like 3.5 microfarads, 3,000 microfarads, and 
what we can do is we can we can actually come up with a pretty simple way of measuring the quantity of how big the capacitance is in the case of the parallel plate capacitor. So that's what we're going to do. We're specifically going to talk about the parallel plate capacitor. It's not the only type of capacitor you can have, but it's pretty much the main one that we're going to be using in this class in terms of the problems that we do and the way we think about these things. Parallel plate capacitors. So what does this look like? Scroll down so you can still see the equation. This is the main equation you're going to be using with capacitors, by the way, so just kind of get used to it. Capacitance is charge divided by voltage. Okay, a parallel plate capacitor. For this, we're going to draw like actual shapes. So, we have two plates. plate right here. Another plate right here. They're parallel to each other. They have the same area. We're going to say the cross-sectional area here is A. Um, we're going to say the distance between the plates is D. And we're going to say that the one on the left has a positive Q and the one on the right has a negative Q for its charge. So this is the positive plate. This is the negative plate. Now, when I have two plates like this, and they're separated by this distance, we can draw an electric field between the plates, right? What direction would that electric field point? What direction would the electric field between the plates point? What is the direction of the electric field between these plates? Yeah. It's right. It's t towards where I wrote A, right? By the way, uh, sorry, I should be more clear here. A stands for area. They both have the same area. Um, but yes, you are right. The electric field between these plates is going to point from left to right, from the positive to the negative, and we also know, and here this is something, this is part of why I had you all do this in that lab. When you all did your labs, you did, uh, basically, you, you, you kind of replicated this parallel plate capacitor thing by using those two pieces of metal. Do you remember what I'm talking about? You took the two plates of metal and you put them in your uh, in your system, right? And you should have found that the electric field, at least in the region close to the middle of the plates, is very uniform and straight, right? That's probably what you found, right? The, ele the equipotential lines were like straight lines that went across like this, and the electric field lines should look like this. So here, I'm going to also, oh, well, let me multi-select. That's right, this, has, this is the only multi-select feature for this one, but that's okay. Um, we'll just do that. The electric field is uniform. It goes throughout the whole thing. Now, we're going to use all the information we've learned in the previous like three chapters, and we're going to try to come up with an expression for what the capacitance of this object is. Okay. We know that capacitance is charge divided by delta V, Okay. But can we relate it to the other quantities here? In fact, I want to make capacitance a function of area, distance, and epsilon naught. Okay? So we want to find the capacitance in terms of A, D, epsilon naught. That's our goal. And I'm actually going to have you do this, but I'm just going to give you the two equations that you need. It's really quite simple to do this derivation. So the two pieces of information that you're going to need are... What is the relationship between the electric potential difference, the electric field, and the distance between the plates in this scenario? Actually, you answered that really quick. You answered that really fast. That's right. So if I have a uniform electric field, right, 
And it's important to understand, by the way, when you when you, when I connect this cable, this wire, up to this left plate right here, that means that the that the potential difference between the plates. I need to write this up here, so I'm gonna move this down to here. The potential difference between these two plates here is also delta V, by the way. And when I know that I have a uniform electric field, the relationship is that the potential difference, delta V, is equal to ed E times D, and there's a negative sign. Do you all remember that? Uniform electric field? Do you all remember that? Do you want me to show you where it comes from real quick? This is our equation for delta V, right? Potential difference between two points is equal to the negative of the integral of the electric field dot product of ds. And since the electric field in this particular situation is constant, that means that we can pull the E out of here, and we just end up doing integral ds from the plus side to the minus side, that's going to give us negative E times the length between these two points, which is D. So that is our relationship. Delta V equals negative E times D. The other relationship we need, I think this is right, is what is the value of the electric field between these plates? If I give you positive plate, negative plate, and I want to find the electric field in the middle, what do you get? They both have the same charge density sigma. That's right. That's right. Sigma over epsilon naught. That's correct. Okay. We did this in class. You probably had multiple. I think you had at least one homework problem where you had like two different plates and you had to figure out what the electric field between them would be. Yeah. I'll. I'll just. I'm just gonna mute. Tom Bui, I'm gonna mute you. If you figure out how to mute yourself, let me know. Shouldn't be a problem, I think. Uh, okay, so we got our information here, and I guess we need one other piece of information, which, what is sigma? Sigma is the charge on the plate divided by the area. Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing here. When I tell you that I have a capacitor and one side has charge positive Q and the other side has char charge as negative Q, what's the total charge? Yeah, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it, Tom. It's not really loud. Zero. Total charge is zero, right? So when I say that the capacitance is defined as charge over vol over uh, delta V, then it's it's the charge on one plate that shows up here, basically. Okay. Okay. So given these three things and the fact that capacitance is defined as charge divided by delta V, can you all do this? Take take a minute or two. See if you can get what C is equal to. Does that make sense? So basically, eliminate electric field, delta V, and I guess sigma, until you get the, the answer for capacitance in terms of A, D, and epsilon naught. Does that make sense, what you need to do? Okay, give it a shot. It shouldn't take too long. It's just a couple, couple, a few lines of algebra.
Okay, did you all get an answer? Is that enough time? If you got an answer, you can type in the chat. Epsilon A over D, that's right. We're gonna get rid of the negative sign. I should have I should have mentioned that. Yeah, that's right. And you can get that by basically saying, okay, what's Q? Well, Q it looks like is sigma A, right? What's delta V? Well, delta V is E times D. But we also know that E is equal to sigma over epsilon naught. So C is equal to epsilon naught A over T. This is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. It only depends on the geometry of the objects. It only depends on the shape, i.e. the area of the plates and the distance between the plates. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to understand, oh, it just, um, capacitance is always a positive number. So basically what we would do there is we would just say, take this and just put absolute value signs around it in all sides. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I left that, I should have, I should have said that. Okay. You know, we could have also said, hey, the charge is negative. We could do all different ways of silly ways of doing it. But the point is that we get this answer and I think it's a pretty reasonable answer. Um, it says that, uh, Epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times area, times, or divided by distance, gives us the size of the capacitance. And let's see if this is reasonable. Is it reasonable? Now, what is capacitance? Capacitance is a measure of how much charge you can hold per unit voltage you have to work with, right? That's what it is. Um, for a given capacitor, right? This, it's, it's important to be able to write this equation in a couple different ways. I, I always, when I think about this equation, I always write it like this, because to me this makes this makes a little more sense to look at it this way. Um, suppose that I tell you that we have a capacitor that has a capacitance of, let's say, one microfarad, right? What this equation tells me is that if I put one microfarad in here, and I multiply by delta V, it tells me that I can get more charge the bigger the voltage difference is, right? Does that make sense? The bigger the value of the voltage, the bigger the charge is gonna be. Direct relationship, that should make sense. If I have a one volt battery, there's only so much charge I can get. A one volt battery is gonna give me one microcoulomb of charge, right? But if I have a hundred microcoulomb, sorry, if I have a hundred volt battery in here, I'm gonna get a hundred microcoulombs of charge out of here, right? Is that reasonable? I like to think of it this way. Regardless, the question is, does this equation make sense? This equation tells us the size of the capacitance, which is directly related to how much charge it can hold, right? Is a function of how big the plates are. Is that reasonable? The bigger the plate, the more charge it can store. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, I mean, it's just like saying that the bigger the container you have, the more liquid you can put into it, right? If I have like a cup, I can only put a cup of liquid into it. If I have a gallon of, of liquid, if I have a gallon, I can put a gallon of liquid into it, right? So the, the bigger it is, the bigger the capacitance is gonna be. The part about this that might be kind of weird is that the, the distance shows up in the denominator. This means that you can increase capacitance by putting the plates really close to each other closer the better, right? And I'll let you think for yourselves about if that makes sense or not. And maybe we'll, uh, without touching. Yeah, if they touch, it's just gonna complete the circuit, right? The main reason why these charges can even stay on the device is because they're not touching. And I'm gonna show you some demos with this in class, but basically, we don't even have to do it in class. We can do it with, uh, with FET. If I have enough time here, I was gonna do it right now. 222. This is a really good part to stop for, for now, and then when we come back, we'll look at some FET um, examples, simulations.
Okay, so let's do that. Let's take a break. We'll take a break until... What time is it? We'll do 2.35. And um, what we're going to do when we come back is we're going to go to this website over here. And we're going to look at how capacitors work. I'm going to stop the recording.